people think of medicine as about charts and data and lab results, and I do too. I'm a physician, I do that stuff a lot. We're trained to do that. But I also think of medicine as a story. I think that everyone on Earth has their own unique healthcare story. I think all of you sitting in the Kennedy Center today listening to this talk and everybody watching it around the world has a really unique healthcare narrative. And as a doctor, it's my job to help you edit the health story that you're, that you're living out, that your life is telling. And as physicians, it's really our signature challenge to do that editing more accurately and efficiently as digital health scales globally. So my own health story started in my hometown of St. Louis where I was an intern at St. Louis City Hospital that was about 12 miles from where I grew up. And I thought I could make a big impact in the inner city and I spent many call nights uh, in the ER at St. Louis City Hospital. I counted them up one bitter evening, it was about 100. And you know that place could be fairly dehumanizing for both providers and patients. It was chaotic, it was crowded. Victims and perpetrators of violence were there, law enforcement officers were there. And in the midst of all that action, uh, parents would bring their children in at midnight, at three in the morning, at five in the morning, and try to you know, access care for sore throats or earaches or rashes. And um, you know, the system then and the system now really didn't have an access point for working parents. It, but it, it failed the poor pretty, pretty dramatically. And working in that environment, you know, I thought to myself, well, you know, many of the, the systems against many of my patients and myself, how do I create some kind of durable relationship with these people? I can treat that kid's sore throat, but it, it felt like a Band-Aid that was gonna fall off, and it was, because many of the problems afflicting that community were social, and the answers were, you know, largely political. So after three years, I, I left that environment and I went on to train as a cardiologist and spent seven years training as a cardiologist and then an invasive electrophysiologist putting in heart devices. Um, I was in San Francisco at a major university hospital at this point and I was part of this amazing, just kind of lucky wave starting in 1995 of incredible device innovation. We were implanting these sophisticated devices in the heart and doing the research. These devices can prevent and treat sudden cardiac death. They can treat and dramatically impact a chronic condition that Dr. Cohn and Fraser talked about earlier, heart failure that afflicts many Americans, makes people feel better, live longer, stay out of the hospital. So that was just a very gratifying time. And, and right down the coast in Silicon Valley, the world was changing also with the information age. So my world was changing because of the information age, but the way that I practiced medicine wasn't changing at all. And I was sitting at the same restaurants with the dot-comers, we were eating the same food, but we were in no way drinking the same Kool-Aid. <laughs> and it took like a number of years before I was even invited or my colleagues down to Sand Hill Road to talk to some investors and technologists because they started to realize, my goodness, you know, there is unbelievable potential in bringing the information age to healthcare to scale across hundreds of millions of patients, but they were still afraid to tame or, or timid to tame or afraid to assail the beast of healthcare. So what, what has evolved? Well, what's evolved is um, a bunch of cool stuff. We have thousands of apps. We have digital coaches, and we have health and fitness apps, and you can access the social community if you think you're eating too much or you think you're smoking too much. But there's no real platform for medicine. There's no Facebook of medicine, no real serious platform to build from. There's not a Google medicine. There's not an Amazon medicine. There's not even an AOL medicine. What there mostly is is a Wikipedia of medicine that my patients love to quote to me all the time, which is fine and good. But, you know, it's, it's not all dismal. Um, I want to tell a story about um, something that's happened in the last six years. W device manufacturers start putting radios on these implanted devices, these $30,000 computers we implant in patients. And in doing so, we could liberate all the information from a device, not just look at it at a every three-month office visit and then historically reconstruct what happened when nobody really remembers, but daily we can look at information downloaded from these devices. So with the device manufacturer, we started a national research program with thought leaders in this area, and I chair that. And what we have in just six short years is really some amazing observations. We now have 200,000 patients with the devices in transmitting to the internet every day to review their data, how the device behaves, how their heart's doing. We have 20 million device downloads. The largest clinical trial in this area is maybe, you know, two, 3,000 patients. And we have information on 150,000 life-saving interventions from the device. So we've been able to really kind of rock our world and make some very important 
uh, observations, but I'll summarize it for you by saying that people who have these devices implanted, who are followed wirelessly, downloading data every day, and perhaps more importantly, being able to push data to docs, live longer. They live longer compared to people who have the devices and don't transmit data. So that is um, a proof of concept. It's very profound. And you may say, you know, why is it? Why is it? Because why would they, why would they live longer? Well, you're suddenly changing this centuries-old medical paradigm. Doctors are partnering with patients across continuous data. Patients have a dog in the fight. They're pushing data if they get symptomatic. They're interacting and partnering with doctors. It's no longer paternalistic in the same way. And you're sort of learning each other, and you don't have to wait months to inter intervene on something. These patients have a lot of stuff happen that can cause strokes, et cetera, so you're able to intervene very quickly. So, you know, this is great, but we still hear from the medical community at a time when you can figure out the t cost of tea in China in a few minutes, and you can access a weather pattern in some some um, exotic place, we still hear from the medical community, look, you know, I don't really know that patients can handle this data unless it's filtered through me. And by the way, I'm inaccessible most of the time, but it's got to be filtered through me. So I've come to sort of view this um, thing about patients being able to continuously interact with their data and with their providers as one of the more important civil rights issues of our era. I mean, it reminds me of other... Uh, of other sort of isms that I've encountered in my life, you know, sexism, racism. It wasn't until people really realized over time that, hey, you know, I can't get where I want to be institutionally or as a, as a company unless I invite in, you know, a bigger talent pool. Similarly, healthcare providers have to realize we can't get the healthcare outcomes we desperately want, that we spend a lot of money thinking about, a lot of talented people, a lot of great technology, unless we truly enfranchise patients like daily uh, in their care. And we can do this. So um, we're seeing, and, and one of the reasons we can do it is because I think the world and technology is sort of ready. We're seeing not only the implantable stuff I showed you, but tons of wearable sensors, diabetic sensors, heart rate sensors that can stream data to, to a smartphone, um, internet-connected phones with wearable sensors. And not only that, they can then contextualize that data. So at the Center for Body Computing, that's an innovation center that I founded, these sensors are coming out of everywhere. They're coming out of gaming. They're coming out of the military. They have enormous potential. They're going to be in your teeth. We're even putting in a, you, them in the car so you can kind of figure out your driving experience in the home. They're going to be uh, ubiquitous, and, the, and they're going to be everywhere. And what's really exciting is you can buy them at the Apple retail store for less than $100. So um, what I'm thinking about now is this, like, very efficient global wireless network, more cell phones than people, uh, carriers finally willing to get really serious about carrying high-end you know, medical data, um, uh, lots of digital storage capability, and vast social networks. And the companies that make or enable all this stuff are like the leading companies in the world. And every government in the world wants better health care, more accessible health care for their population. So it seems like it's, it's lining up pretty well. I want to tell you a couple personal things. I don't know how many of you guys have seen this Alive Core technology. It was developed by a doctor. It's basically an iPhone case with two electrodes on it. So you know nobody leaves home without their smartphone. So you can put your fingers on the back of this case and get a, a 30 second EKG. We did a study at our annual conference for body computing where we gave this iPhone case out to 50 people. Only 20% were doctors. They were entertainment people and business people and students, et cetera. What we found was they learned how to use it right away. Over eight weeks, they transmitted 36 tracings a week. I reviewed all of those. 60% um, of people lent it to somebody else. I recorded you know, my dog's EKG, everybody's EKG in my household. <laughs> it was really amazing. And, and one day I was at home, and I was looking at, at some of these tracings, pulling them down from the cloud, and I, I saw this acute ischemic event, an impending heart attack. So I was able to identify a Nigerian gentleman in Mumbai and notify him that he was having this event and he was asymptomatic. That's like this brilliant example of leveraging um, your expertise that I just find pretty interesting. This is uh, another personal story. Two months ago, I'm playing tennis one night. I play tennis on Monday nights. I'm playing with a 19-year-old kid. She's a pretty good player. She plays at a local junior college. They won the state championships. So at the end of 90 minutes, she misses the last point. I'm at the net. She never does that. So I turn around, and she's like slumping toward the fence. And I go over, and her pulse is really quick. And I pick up this heart rhythm. I hope you can see. And her heart rate was 260 beats a minute. That's a life-threatening heart rate. Was just with my iPhone case, I diagnosed this. So I was able to do a physical maneuver and terminate it. And then I actually got her like life story. So it turns out that she'd played, already played five hours of tennis that day. She was slumming playing with me. 
She'd not eaten or drinking very much that day, and she'd socialized the night before. So <laughs> why was that so profound to me? Well, because I spent 20 years putting devices and studying sudden death prevention and dealing with sudden death that occurs in the athlete, the elite athlete. It's a very tragic event. And I never once considered that this type of rhythm could cause sudden death in the athlete. But this is the exact rate that life-threatening rhythms from the lower chamber of the heart occur. It wasn't until I had our life story and I started thinking about what's an elite athlete, what's a champion, somebody who pushes harder through everything, who endures pain. So I'm, you know, I'm going home and I'm telling my husband until I can't stand it anymore that this is like unbelievably profound. I've always thought of sudden death this way. I've suddenly been liberated from this paradigm that kept me from advancing the science further. And now I'm you know, really thinking about our athletic monitoring programs and stuff in a very, very different way. Um, so it's that life story. It's the ability to know the context in which she had that rhythm, why this young woman could make that rhythm, which usually is pedestrian and goes half as fast, go that fast, because she's an elite racehorse, because she pushes herself and does all that that led to all this understanding. And once we start to incorporate all this, we'll get a much better a picture of health. So I don't think we're just looking for the medical channel here with mobility and information. We're looking for the life channel so we can really um, impact healthcare outcomes. So we're starting this initiative, this bridge to the sort of digital divide by creating a platform. We've been working on this for about a year. And what we want to do is create that first point of contact. So we want to use the five billion cell phones in the world to collect the heartbeat of every person on the world. And this will start to create, through any sensor, we want to be agnostic to that, and open up this platform. This will start to create that digital dialogue where patients will empower this revolution in medical care, and they'll be a big part of it by inputting their data and, and understanding uh, their health and, and disease behavior. And we heard about digital data earlier, and this isn't a digital data problem. We estimate that being able to collect everybody's heart rate in the world for a year will require less digital space than um, watching the movie Avatar once. And that's a great and entertaining story, but I challenge you that this will be an even better story with even greater um, impact. So um, I sort of imagine this world uh, where people share data like they do their social activity and life experience, uh, but it's health data uh, across the world on a vast network so that that child in an ER at three in the morning in Mumbai or Bangladesh or Sao Paulo or the Bronx or LA is, is sort of the same when we're understanding this commonality of humanity and being able to access people and things and activity and learn through big data and through analytics about endemic diseases, about disease prevention. I mean, imagine getting a call from your doctor who may be somewhere else in the world that you're about to get sick and they want to institute uh, some things or they've noticed a trend versus um, you having to proactively reach out, truly um, a different paradigm. So you know, I came a long way 25 years ago. I was, I was thinking I was going to make a big impact in the inner city, and now I'm just envisioning um, a world where ERs are filled with true emergencies and not just desperate people uh, trying to seek some kind of health care um, where you know, the system is pretty indifferent to you know, the economic status of the patient. So I think that everybody deserves to tell their story. I think it's very rational to start one heartbeat at a time and that we can change the world for 5 billion people.